Um, all right, so our first speaker this afternoon is Alexandra Kwan, who comes to us from UCLA, where she's a rising sophomore. Uh, Alexandra has been working this summer uh, with Lauren, and she'll tell us today about her project, Modeling Chemical Abundance Evolution in Dwarf Galaxies. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming to my presentation. I am very excited to share with you all what I've been working on all summer. So let's start by breaking down this title. What exactly is it that we're doing? So modeling is when you have a set of data that you want to fit to an equation with certain parameters. And the simplest example I can think of to explain this is if you had a set of data that you wanted to fit to a straight line with the equation y equals mx plus b. In this example, the model is the y equals mx plus b, and the parameters are m and b. And the goal of modeling is finding the best m and b parameters that can make a straight line that best describes the data. Only our model will be a lot more complicated, but the same general principles apply. And what we are modeling is the chemical abundance, and that's the amount of different elements within a galaxy. Additionally, I will be using the term metallicity, which is also another way of describing the amounts of different elements. And evolution is, of course, the change over time. So putting it all together, we are working on finding a model with the best parameter values that explains how the different amounts of elements within a galaxy changes over time. So what is the importance of understanding metallicity evolution? On a larger scale, understanding galaxy evolution is crucial to understand how the universe develops. And specifically, we focus on dwarf galaxies because they are a lot smaller and more manageable to work with when making simulations and models. But they still have the properties of a galaxy. So it's kind of like this first step into understanding galaxy evolution as a whole. And specifically, when we look at the metallicity, it's kind of like looking at the DNA of a galaxy. It's everything that makes up the galaxy, so it largely impacts how the galaxy behaves. The only difference is the metallicity within a galaxy actually changes over time. As stars within the galaxy form new materials within their core, and those stars explode and release those materials into the galaxy, and those materials get mixed and form new stars, the process continues and the metallicity constantly evolves. And it's interesting to look at that change over time. So there have been models in the past that have modeled chemical evolution, but our model specifically will improve upon past inferences by including a variance parameter in the metallicity. In most previous models, they only find the mean metallicity, which sort of overlooks the spread of that metal. In reality, metals don't mix evenly within a galaxy, so there is some scatter and spread of the elements within each galaxy. And by including the variance parameter, we will be able to better understand not only the metallicity, but the metallicity distribution within the galaxy. So how do we plan on doing this? Obviously, we can't go back in time and just look at the chemical evolution. So we have to use observable values that we can find today in order to infer information about the past. And one of the main tools that we have to work with is the metallicities of the stars within the galaxy today. We can say that the metallicity of a star is somewhat representative of the metallicity of the entire galaxy at the time the star was formed, since the star was formed from the materials of the galaxy. Then with the measured star formation rates that tell us approximately when each star was formed, we can make sort of a roadmap with all the observed metallicities and the observed form times that can tell us how the chemical abundance within the, uh, within the galaxy has evolved over time. So the exact methods we will be using to make this model are Bayesian inference, which is a statistical method that we use to find probability equations that tell us how likely our parameter values are to yield our observed values. To sample these likelihoods, we will be using MCMC sampling, which is a method of exploring the parameter space and finding the most likely parameter values of the model. So our project will occur in three main steps. We will begin by modeling simulated data because we know a lot more about simulated galaxies. And then we can have true values that we can compare our inferred parameters to so we can see how accurate our model is before we apply it to real galaxies. 
The simulated data we will be using is actually from other scientists here at Carnegie, Andrew Emmerich, and actually another summer student, Suyash Kumar. You might have seen his presentation earlier, but we use two different simulations. One is one giga year long, and the other is 13 giga, year long, giga years long, and they both are of low mass dwarf galaxies. So once we finish modeling the simulated data, we will move on to modeling the real galaxy data, and we will likely choose the Sculptor Dwarf Galaxy because there is a lot of information about the metallicities of the stars within Sculptor, as well as approximate form times of those stars. And finally, once we have our inferred parameters, we will compare those to other simulations to see if we can constrain even more information about the galaxy. Only the project isn't as simple as it sounds, and before we make any inferences, we need to build a functional model, which is what we've spent most of the summer doing. So, so far we've made a flexible model, and we are working now on making a more informed model. So our flexible model is what we first began with, and we directly put the chemical evolution parameters into our likelihood equations. So these parameters are the star formation rate, which tells us approximately how many stars are formed, the mean abundance, which tells us what metallicity we should anticipate from these stars formed, and then the variance from that mean. So we took the simulation and we divided it up into separate time steps. And we use these parameters for each time step. So at the end of the model, we can compare how the parameters have changed from each time step and therefore the overall chemical evolution. For the means and variances, we calculated it for each element. And a downside of this model is that it only works for one element at a time. We then compared all of these parameters to the observed values. So the star formation rate was compared to the observed star formation rate at the time period. And the mean and variances were compared to the observed metallicities of the stars formed in that time period. And all of this occurred within likelihood calculations that eventually returned us the best fit parameters. That were, those were the values of the star formation rate means and variances, and that helps us describe the chemical evolution over time. The only problem with this model is it was too flexible and it produced up to 500% error, which is far too large for what we wanted to do. So we knew that we needed a way to inform the model more about the actual galaxy physics. We had none of these parameters correlated. They were all allowed to explore their own space. And we decided we needed a way to coordinate the parameters more in order to align more with the true values. So that brought us to making the informed model. In our informed model, we use an existing chemical evolution model called ChemPy. So what ChemPy does is it takes in galaxy parameters and it runs a bunch of models based on stellar and star formation physics in order to produce predicted abundances. So the galaxy parameters that it takes in are things like how much each of each element, each star yields when it explodes, how much gas within the galaxy actually goes into star formation, how long it takes for a star to explode, and many other parameters that affect the final galaxy abundances. An interesting thing about ChemPy is it actually allows us to calculate the abundances for 30 plus elements at a time, which really opens the door to us exploring the chemical evolution of more elements than we were from the first model. So the way the informed model works is quite different from the flexible model because we use different parameters. Instead of the chemical evolution parameters, we are using the galaxy parameters, which again are all different properties of the galaxy that impact the final abundances of elements within the galaxy. So all of these parameters are fed into ChemPy, which then return us the most likely abundances based on those values. And we can compare those chemical abundances to the observed metallicities of the stars within the galaxy. Additionally, because star formation rate is so important since it determines when a star was born, we calculate the star formation rate separately and we compare that to the observed star formation rate. And again, this all occurs within the likelihood calculations that give us back the best fit parameter values. The only difference is this time the parameter values are the galaxy parameters. And we can then feed those galaxy parameters back into ChemPy to get the chemical abundance evolution. So while this model is a lot more complicated than our first model, it actually gives us more information about the galaxy. 
not only do we get the chemical evolution, but we also can infer overarching galaxy parameters that really describe how the entire galaxy has evolved. So there is a lot of future work to be done because we haven't even finished with the informed model yet. So one of the main things we have to do is we have to understand Kempi better. This has also been one of the main challenges in making this model, is that Kempi is such a complicated code with hundreds of parameters that all affect the abundances in different ways. We really need to study each parameter and their equations a little bit more so we can better understand what is actually impacting the final abundances so we can adjust our model accordingly. Additionally, it is very slow right now. Our model takes a very long time to run. So we are looking into ways to speed up this process, which include looking into possible different sampling methods, as well as training a neural network on Kempi. And of course, the ultimate goal is to apply this model to the sculptor dwarf galaxy. And it will be very interesting to see not only the chemical evolution of the dwarf galaxy, but also the variance within the distribution, as well as the overarching galaxy parameters. So just from the observed star formation rates and the observed metallicities of the stars, we can tell a lot about the dwarf galaxy using our model, which is very interesting. So that's all I have. Thank you all for listening. I can take any questions now. All right, very nice job. Questions for Alexandra? Oh, I think I probably could say something or ask something. If that's Go okay. ahead, Andy. Um, yes, yeah, so this Kempi, I, I'm, I guess I should read more on models, but um, in dwarf galaxies, just observationally, I see a preponderance of or excesses of S process elements. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that that was because gas is just leaking out of the galaxy and the lowest velocity gas is ejected by AGB stars and they make S process elements. And then, you know, the mean metallicities being low, I mean, to me that probably a lot of gas is left. So does this program, Kempi, consider uh, leaky boxes like that, that depend, that um, has, you know, different leakage rates. You, for example, uh, type 1a supernova have pretty high velocity, ejection velocities, so you might expect more of that to escape, uh, and, so, and so forth. Yeah, Kempai actually does take all of that into account. That's some of the many parameters that I mentioned that we aren't working directly with, but they are incorporated into the model. And what's nice about Kempai is we can change any of the values that we want to. So, for example, like you mentioned, the AGB yields and how much of that mass actually gets ejected outside of the galaxy versus actually what stays in the galaxy and contributes to star formation. So that is all within Kempai, which is another advantage of using that model. And then what about stochastic IMF, for example? And yeah, we also have that in the model as well. Any other questions for Alexandra? All right, everyone's being so shy today. Okay, all right, very nice job, Alexandra. Thank you. Uh,